What's that? I'm a bass player. That's right. All right. Um, is there any way we can, nah, I guess not, dim the lights a little bit? Is this like super bright? Nah, it's fine. Whatever. Uh, we, yeah. I have, uh, uh, there we go. Okay, turn it back on. I'll, I'll, I'll take one for, yeah, just turn it back on. In our house, I turn all the lights on. Always get in trouble. But, um, so I want to talk about reigning by life. Don't worry, this is not like a 21 steps to a greater you and how to live your best life now. It's more of how to live a life that is the, the fullness of God's life to where we don't waste our life. You know, a few years from now, we're all going to be standing before the judgment seat of Christ and de- where our life will be evaluated, every single one of us, right? And we want to make, we want, to, we want to, to, our lives to have, we don't want to waste our life. You know, life is a vapor. I mean, just seeing how all the kids that are now teenagers and driving, you know, Ben's graduating, what, Saturday, next week? Like, you know, it's like it goes by so fast. Um, and we don't want to waste that, right? None of us do. And a lot of times we're going around, you know, obviously we have the cares of life. We have, um, you know, we have family, we have work. But in that, we can still have focus and purpose. You know, without vision, people go unrestrained, right? So essentially what that means is if you don't have a vision for what you're here for, you will live an unrestrained life, an undisciplined life, a life of just wandering and just purpose, purposelessness. Right? There's no sense of purpose. And so today we want to kind of help that, right? We want to give context. Um, there's a scripture this, this is based on, is in Romans 5.17. It says, I'm going to read it. For by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one. Much more, those who receive the abundance and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one, Jesus Christ. You know, and so we want to focus on reign in life. And that word for life, as we've heard before, there's multiple Greek words for life. There's bios, which is like my, our flesh, you know, or that's where we get biology from. There's suke, and that's kind of your, your soul, right? That's your mind, your will, your emotion. That's where you get psychology from. Um, but the life here is, is a different kind of life. It's God's life. It's just called zoe. It's the fullness of life. So when we put that together, we say reign in God's life. It's like, that doesn't really make sense. And I agree, it doesn't. Because um, the word in there, I-N, can also be translated by and so a better translation would be to reign by God's life, right? And so the, the foundation for that is, is uh, the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, right? So if we don't have that foundation of righteousness, we cannot reign by God's life. What reigning by God's life is not, right? So you know, the temporalness of life. You know, Jesus said, do not store for yourself, you know, treasures on earth. Um, this past week, John and I, for work, went to, went to New York City. Uh, I love going to New York City. I love the walkability of it. I love the, the culture, the, the food. Um, you know, we work for, our company is in the, the, the middle, like, snap, smack, smack dab in the middle of, like, global finance. Like, we, our company is essentially one of the backing, the backbones of the global financial systems. I love working there. It's, it's gr- they're great people, they're smart people, um, just so professional, so full of excellence. And it's great being in a, in a, in a, with a group of people like that because it, it, it does make us better. But when I was there, it was just like, man, just thinking, like, I love, I love, I'm so thankful for my job. I'm so thankful for the people who work there. But you think, like, all this work, all this focus, all this discipline, all this, and then you, you retire, and then you die. And it's like, 
all that, all that for, for nothing, you know? And it's like, that's, there's more than, there's more, there's more to life than this. Now, we have to work. I want to, I want to, like, I love working. I love my job. I, we have to work. But my focus in my life is not my job. My focus in, like, my, the main thing that I'm driving for is not that, though I'm thankful for it, and though I will work, I work incredibly hard, and, you know, as unto the Lord, but that is not where, that's not what drives me, right? Um, Jesus said that the, or actually Paul said that, you know, the kingdom of heaven is not in external things. It's not in eating. It's not in drinking. But it's in righteousness. It's peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's where the true kingdom is. Um, and to reign, in, to reign by life, essentially, is to, be, is to live the life on this earth that God has destined every single human being to live. It's, it's in... The rain, you know, the fullness of His Spirit. Um, you know, Jesus, when He, when He, when He, when He came, He said, "The kingdom of heaven is at hand." And He began to teach about these things. He began to teach, you know, about the Sermon on the Mount. And so, what I want to do now is, you know, we're we're in the weeds. We see these things. We're we're we're, we're going through life. We have, um, you know, the crazy schedules where, you know, our culture of just 100 miles an hour, you know, we're trying to, to like, <clears throat> to make sense of everything. We hear about indwelling life, right, indwelling life. But I want to, I think for us to properly understand and to get context and to really have impact, we need to, we need to take a step back. You know, you've heard this, you know, like, in the weeds. We need to get out of the weeds. And so, like, if we were to if God were to, like, bring us up above and we could see, you know, you think about it. Like, <clears throat> I remember I was thinking yesterday about this and, the, you know, this, the movie, um, Honey, I Shrunk the, the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. And I remember, it's funny, I was just thinking about Justin yesterday or maybe it was Friday. And I think y'all went to Disney World one time in MGM Studios, and y'all were riding like the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and he was telling me about it. And I was like, "Oh, that sounds really cool," you know. But it, you know, it's a it's a it's a dumb movie that we had when we were kids. But you think about it, like the perspective of things. They were shrunken in their their yard, and you know, a, a ant was like a big giant monster, right? And so their their focus was. They were so much in the weeds that they didn't have the right perspective, right? Obviously, and so I, I want us to do that. And to do that, we need to go back to God's view of this, of 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 where we are, right? And it starts in eternity past. I know we've we've talked about eternal blueprint. We're gonna we're gonna just do a little bit of review. Um, if we could just kind of summarize. We are called to be adopted as sons. And I'm going to explain these two. We're called as the bride of Christ. We are called to be overcomers and co-heirs. We are called to have the fullness of his life. We are called to be conformed to his image. And we are called to bring healing to the nations through his life. So a few scriptures that kind of highlight some of these. Ephesians 1.5. It says, he has predestined us for the adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to his will. So whenever you read the Bible and you see the word predestined, take note. It says in Ephesians 1.11, also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose. He works all things after the counsel of his will. Romans 8.29, for he, those he, whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, that he, his son, Jesus Christ, would be the firstborn of many brethren. And then in Colossians, it says, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. So let's look at that word predestined. And I know this is a review for a lot of us, but you know, I, this even review will get this deep into us. 
So that word for, for predestined is, is, is two words together. It's pro horizo. Pro meaning before. And then horizo is where we get uh, the word horizon from. And it simply means to mark out band, boundaries or limits of any place or thing once the boundaries have been established. It's to define those boundaries or limits of any place or thing from these boundaries for which they were determined beforehand. In other words... It's a blueprint, right? So when we when we read those when we read those scriptures, let's read them, let's think of it again in the context of this. It says, He determined beforehand that we would be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ. He determined beforehand that we would be conformed into his image. What does that mean? He determined beforehand. That's the purpose. That's why we're here, right? And when we read through Scripture, there's not one place in, in the Bible that says these things, right? You've got to look. You've got to remember the, revel, the revelation that we see in, in Scripture was progressive, right? That's why we see in, you know, in, in the New Testament when Paul's teaching, he's talking about the mystery, the mystery, the mystery. See, it was progressive, Revelation. Now we have the entire canon, the entire, um, all everything in one place. When we go through and we kind of dig, and, and the Lord brings connection, we can kind of see. Oh wait, they, things fit together, and it's kind of like it's kind of like a puzzle, right? Um, we have a lot of times when we go on vacation, we'll do puzzles, and a lot of times when we're doing these puzzles, you know, there'll be. 500 pieces, let's say, and they're small, and you're like, okay, I think this one goes there, and you're like, kind of goes there, and you push it, and really hard, and it's like, yeah, okay, it goes there. But then later on, as you get more and more, you're like, well, I don't think that actually goes there. And then you find one that goes there, and it fits. And then, then you find where the other one goes, and it fits. And it just, it just works. And this kind of like, it's kind of like that with, with this. As, as we begin to understand what God's eternal purpose is, the reason you're here, the reason I'm here, the reason all of this is here, it will begin to bring clarity and to bring understanding. It'll be, it'll be, um, it'll make sense, right? And so that's what we want to do. So if we were to kind of like think of, I guess for the, uh, like if we could take, <coughs> That entire puzzle, God's eternal blueprint, right? Before the foundation of the world, we know it's just it's, God, it's the, the Godhead together, and they come up with essentially five things that are the purpose and reason for creation, and it's His eternal blueprint. And those five things are the following: It says the sun will be the center of everything in heaven and on the earth. The Father, number two. The Father will have a family of Christ-like sons. Number three, the Son will have an equally yoked bride. Number four, the Holy Spirit will have a temple, a house, a body that he fully possesses. And then lastly, believers will ha have been invited to eternal intimacy, eternal authority, and eternal glory. So we take two of these, sons and the bride, they're, they're different. They're two different expressions of, of intimacy. Bride being a oneness, a, you know, think of a, a husband and a wife, that, that, that oneness, right? And then sons think of as <coughs> the inheritance, right? And, and they go together. It's just different ways of saying, of saying the same thing. So for this message, we're going to focus on three of those things. I mean, indirectly the other ones too. And that would be our... Um, the father will have a family of Christ-like sons, adoption. The son will be at the center of all things. We are to be conformed into his image. Again, remember the scriptures we just read about determined beforehand. It talked about adoption, and it talked about being conformed to the image of Christ. And then the son will be the center of all things. So when we hear adoption, every one of us, unless we know otherwise, think of Adoption in our world, right? Like, I'm going to adopt a baby. Well, that's not what adoption was in the, in the first century, in the Greco-Roman wor world. 
it was it was different. And what it was was they had you got to remember back then life expectancy were, was very short. So imagine we'll take we'll pick on Larry here. Let's say Larry was just he was a <clears throat> very wealthy man, and he had he had lots of people depending on him. <laughs> I'm speaking, you're just kidding. Uh, he, had, he, he had lots of people depending upon him, okay? He had, um, let's say, you know, hundreds of people he, he was, that, were, that were dependent upon him for, for their livelihood. He was very wealthy, but he didn't have any children. So what was he going to do? Like, he couldn't leave it to anyone. Like, how was he going to leave this to someone? If he, if he goes, who's going to take over his possessions? Who's gonna, those people, who are they going to be dependent upon? And so what would happen is Larry would, <coughs> essentially, he would adopt a child who was young for the purpose and training for them to take over his inheritance, right? And so the act of adoption was, I'm going to bring this child into the family. They're young, they're immature, but I'm going to train them. I'm going to train them in the ways that I think and how to run and how to run this uh, Everything, right? How to, you know, the money, the the agriculture, all these things, you know, business. I'm going to teach this child how to run. And there would be a, what we call a child trainer. That child trainer, their, their purpose was to groom that child so that they would mature and go into and, and have their inheritance, right? So then when Larry goes on, there's someone there to take over. And so you could think like, okay, the responsibility of this position is very high, right? The, I mean, it's not, you got to remember, it, it wasn't for this person's, hey, look at me, look at this position I have. No, the purpose was for others, right? If that, if, if, if that process didn't happen, so many people who depended upon Larry would be just lost. They would be completely in the dark. And so this, this enabled a way to, to, you know, continue this from generation to generation. And so there would come a time when the child, after going through this training, was, was ready. They had matured. That process is called adoption. Okay? So now, let's look at that in terms of what does God mean by, you, it was determined beforehand for the adoption as sons, what he's saying is God's kingdom that he's expanding, you know, starting in earth, is we are called into to be adopted as sons. In other words, it is a, we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, right? So when we hear we are adopted as sons, that's what he's talking about, right? But then also we're supposed to be conformed into the image of Christ. Sorry, my computer's here acting up. Oh, goodness gracious. All right, let's skip that slide. So when we see adoption, in, there's two places in adoption, or sorry, in the Bible where um, he talks about adoption. Number one is in Galatians. And then it's also in, um, I mean, there may be more than two, but two that really like stick out in my mind. And the other one is in Romans, right? Romans 8, you know, 8 speaks about adoption. And then Galatians, but they're, they're slightly different. And so when we read in Galatians, there's two things that really stick out. Um, there's the, you know, it talks about us being adopted. And it says the law is the tutor to lead us to Christ. That tutor is, is the child trainer, right? It's the, what we were talked about. It's the process to train, train the child. Um, and so when we, when we see Galatians, the blessing <coughs> that we inherit is the indwelling spirit, right? So the context of adoption in Galatians is, is, is not adoption into sonship. It's adoption into the family. But he uses the same language as Prior to that, prior to that event, there was a there was the law that was essentially the child trainer to to be ready to receive the indwelling spirit. Right? There had to be context. Like after the fall, Jesus couldn't just come. There had to be context. Right? There had to be 
there had to be a, a framework, so to speak. We had to know what, uh, you know, essentially how everything, what God expects. And that's, that's, that's the law. The law is the tutor to lead us to Christ. Um, but in Romans 8.28, or Romans 8, I think it's 20, whatever, the verse uh, 29, and it talks about adoptions as sons. Actually, it talks about, uh, sorry, it talks further up. I'm getting my verses confused. Um, you know, we're to be heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. It says, if we suffer with him, we'll be glorified with him. But here, the child trainer is not the law, it's the Holy Spirit. You know, it's talking about living by the Spirit, living by the Spirit. The child trainer is, is, is what we have now that is training us to be adopted as sons. Um, and the test, this is why they're testing our faith is more precious than gold, right? And so... Being having the Holy Spirit train us, then comes the adoption, which we'll see we'll see in a little bit later. Um, I'll read it here. This is the verse I was just get. Um, there are so many verses I have. I'm trying to like I'm getting them confused. But in Romans eight twenty nine, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed into the image of his Son, that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Um, you know, Jesus, when they, when they created mankind, they said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, right? So we see pre, predetermined plan that, that he would be the firstborn, that Christ would be the firstborn, we would be conformed to his image. And then in creation, it says, let us make man into our image and into our likeness and let them rule. Right. That's that's we see that, um, you know, Adam was innocent, but he had to be tested. Right. And we know the story the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Um, he had to be tested. So if he was going to have this and, you know, it was essentially the child training. It was the training. As we, again, like original intent was adoption. It, it was training for for rule. So Adam was called to rule. But he had to be trusted. He had to be trained. And so, what did the Lord do? He he put he put two trees there. And we know the story. It's a, it's if you eat of this tree, you will the day you eat, the day you eat of it, not a thousand years later. The day you eat of this tree, you will die. Right? The day. And so, if we think about it. It says that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was, was pleasing to the eyes, right? It was pleasing to the eyes. Um, they ate. Did they physically die right away? No. They spiritually died. That's when death entered in. It started, it was progressive. It started in their, the death started in their spirit and then eventually worked into the rest of their body and they, and they physically died. Right, um, and that's when sin entered the world. Uh, but God had a path to restoration, and and a lot of times, probably I would say not even a lot of times, I would say ninety five percent of the body of Christ is focused on re, of, of just redemption as in, in terms of salvation from from sin, right? Um, but that just gets us. Redemption just gets us back onto the path uh, of restoration. Um, so let's talk about the path of restoration. So it started with it started with Abraham. Afterwards, you know, God called Abraham out, um, and then it, it was the after that was was the law. It says the law was given um, because of transgressions until. You know, all caps, I capitalize it. The seed would come. Who's the seed? The seed is Christ. The law was the tutor to lead us to Christ. He's the child trainer. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. We have been adopted into the family by the Father. That those who believe him, he gave to the right to become children of God. Inheritance uh, into the family through Christ. All right. Sorry, one second here. Okay, so context, we're spiritually dead, right? So God is restoring us back. 
So we're spiritually dead. And this is where we have the indwelling, where the indwelling life comes in. And so we all know the story when um, Jesus was talking to Nicodemus in John 3. So Nicodemus was a ruler of, of, the, um, of, the, of the Jews, of, of Israel. He was a ruler. He was one of the higher up Pharisees. He, you know, the qualifications to be a Pharisee, like you had, like the knowing the scriptures, being able to memorize the scriptures, like he was, you know, th- think of it in terms of like our, our definition of success. He was like up at the top. Um, but he knew, he saw Christ and he knew, hey, something's very different about Jesus. And so he wanted to meet with him at night. Um, not that that, there's maybe nothing significant about that. It was just, that's when they met. They met at night. And he, they were talking, and Nicodemus was like, hey, you know, um, basically talking about his miracles. And then Jesus goes right to the heart of the matter. And he said, um, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're, you know, born again. And he's like, wait, it's completely out of left field. Like, where is that coming from? But he was... He was hitting to the heart of it, right? He, he, was, he was going right straight to the matter. And Nicodemus was like, wait, what? What do you mean? He says, you must be born of water and of the spirit. And he's like, you're the teacher of Israel. How do you not know these things? How do you not know this? And so if you think about it, he should have known what being born of the spirit and being um, born of water meant. Right? So how would he have known that? Because it's, it's talked about in the Old Testament. And if we, if we read in uh, Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, we'll see exactly what Jesus was talking about. It says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and all your idols. There's the water. I will clean you. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. So we see there's two parts to this. There's the cleansing, the water, and then there's the, the, the being born of the spirit. So when mankind sinned, we were spiritually dead. So there is absolutely zero things you can do to raise yourself from the dead, right? God gives us the grace. He draws us. But it's our response. Are we going to say yes? And if we do, we are, that moment of salvation, we are raised from the dead. Like literally, our spirit is raised from the dead. It, we are regenerated by the Holy Spirit. This is nothing you can do. It's nothing I can do. It is a work of God. But God won't do that until we're cleansed. Like, there's the, the, the water, the cleansing comes first. And that's why we see in justification. Like the, the, when we see what happened at the cross and the resurrection, two things happen. Number one, justification. We were made declared righteous. Number two, the indwelling Holy Spirit. They go together. So you didn't make yourself righteous. I didn't make myself righteous. God made me righteous through faith. It's through faith God declared me righteous. And then he gave me a new spirit. He put his spirit within me, and he gave me a new spirit. And so when, we, when you look back to the tree of life, what happened after they ate? They, they cut off access to the tree of life. And the reason they cut off access because they didn't want, because of sin, God did not want them to eat of the tree of life and live forever in that state. So they couldn't experience the life, the rebirth of their spirit that had just died until sin was dealt with, right? What is dealt with at the cross? Sin was dealt with. Now that sin has been dealt with, what happens? We get a new life. We get born of his spirit. 
So to Nicodemus, his religious upbringing meant nothing. Absolutely nothing. His doing meant nothing. It was garbage. It was completely worthless. Paul even said when he was going through his qualifications about about his you know time as being a Pharisee, he listed all these things, and he he basically said they were like dung. That's the word translated. It's like it's like dung. You can't even get more descriptive about how bad something is than that. It is like dung. All those work, they're completely worthless. It's completely worthless. And so that's essentially what was, is going on between Nicodemus and, and Jesus. He says, you, in order to see the kingdom, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In order to see that, you must be born of the water and of the spirit. You must be forgiven of your sins through the, again, he's speaking, I mean, he's, he's speaking, I mean, what's to come too, right? With the cross, the resurrection, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But what he's saying is, you must be born again, which what happens is your spirit, or sorry, you're, um, you're forgiven of your sins, you're cleansed, and you're given a new spirit. So when we look at the, uh, when we look at the, the, what happens at new birth from Ezekiel, it says, I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll take your heart of stone, which that was, that, that was hardened through the fall. I will give you a new heart. I will take, um, I'll give you a new spirit. So we have a brand new, that's the resurrected spirit. But it's a little different than it was before. And the difference is I will put my spirit within you. So think of here's my spirit and here's the spirit of God and it's one. A good analogy of this is, um, is uh, like when we go to, well, this last time was fine, but previous times when we would go to Africa, we would have to bring... Um, the instant coffee, right? And so you have the water, and then you have the coffee, and you mix it together. Like, all right, try to um, separate that. You really, you really can't do that. You cannot separate that. It's, it is one. That's what happens when we're born again. The uncreated Christ life, the indestructible life, comes inside of us. It has nothing to do with, you know, how, how you know, you're, you, it's him. That's what's inside of us. Every single one of us who has been born again, the, we have the life of Christ in us. It's amazing when we think about it. You know, Paul goes on in Thessalonians, it says that God would sanctify us entirely, body, soul, and spirit. So we see we have three parts. Our spirit, as we just saw, when we're, is justified. And because of the justification, the water, the cleaning, we are born again. And we get a new birth, a new spirit. That, that is immediate. That, hap, that, is, that is the seed. That happens immediately. Um, so when we hear, have you been saved? Like in scripture, have you been saved? That's what it's talking about. The salvation of our spirit. Salvation of our soul is, is the conforming to the image of Christ. We have in our spiritual DNA, we now have the ability for that to be possible because of the indwelling spirit, because of a new spirit. We, we have the ability for that to be possible. And so the sanctification of our soul, think of as adoption, is the child training work. It's what, it's what from new birth until death that we're in, it's the work that God is doing to train us to be able to have the inheritance that is to come, which we'll talk about in a minute. So aimlessly going about life, no, there's purpose. Like I, what I'm going through right now, what y'all are going through right now is child training work of the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't think of it lightly. Don't take it, you know, don't, don't get discouraged like when things don't go your way, don't get discouraged. Like you're being trained, you're being groomed by the Holy Spirit for an inheritance. So when we're in hard situations, what is that? Most likely it's probably the Lord training us. You know, I had a frustrating experience on the way in today. I, you know, I was 
I'm driving out of the neighborhood, this guy's on my tail, and I'm like, I started thinking about Evan. I'm like, he's going to be driving out here soon, and I'm like, I wouldn't, it was kind of, you know, for me, it was not a big deal because I've been driving for a while, but like, for a teenager driving, and this guy's on my, you know, on the tail. Anyway, so I sped up, and I was turning onto my, onto due west, and he like ran right in front of me and got in front of me to turn before me, and I'm like, so of course I, um, it, you know, it's like the Sermon on the Mount, like, I did, oh, you fool, and with my horn, essentially. Um, you know, I was just like, rah, 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 you know. And anyway, I was like, first thing I'd say is like, oh, you know, anger, storm on the mount. I'm like, yes, okay, whatever. I'm sorry. But, you know, so we're all, again, like, was that the devil? No, it was probably the Lord. I was totally the Lord, like, you know, helping me to, to have more of his nature. But the child training work of the Holy Spirit is what we are, is what we're in now. It's in our work, it's the the test. You're going to be tested tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times in this life. Like it's, it's just going to happen. And it's, it's for, it's for reigning. It's for training for reigning. Not everybody's going to, could go through it. Not every born again believer is going to go through this. They're, they will not be adopted into their inheritance. Now, they're adopted into God's family. They're, they're, they're children of God. They have eternal life. But when it comes to sonship, when it com- they will not. That's why being ready is so important. Um, and then lastly is the final act, is glorification. And glorification is the resurrection of the dead at the end of the age. It's when we are placed in Christ's inheritance. And so when we read in, in Romans about, about creation, the longing of creation, this is what it's talking about. It's talking about the adoption into sonship. And so when we look at back in the garden where we had Adam, death started immediately, but it took a while to reach his body. Well, now it's the opposite. Life starts immediately in our spirit, and then eventually it works out into our soul, and then finally into, into, the, um, into the resurrected body at the, uh, at the end of the age. And so sanctification is now life-based. Again, our, our regeneration of the spirit was life-based. Our sanctification is now life-based. It's not doing, doing, doing. You, you can't sanctify yourself. It's not. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so to, to, really, to really have a good understanding of, of this, we have, to really, we have to know what's in us. We have to know about the indwelling life. Um, one of the best places in Scripture that, to me, that really highlight this um, is when Jesus is on the Feast of Tabernacles. It's in John 17, 38. So the Feast of Tabernacles, I know there's, you know, there's multiple feasts. Uh, there's three main feasts, Feast of Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And so this was during the Feast of Tabernacles. And um, you know, he was in Jerusalem, and he said, from his innermost being, he says, he who believes in me, so Jesus is Jesus talking. So he who believes in me from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. We've all read that. But the context of what he was saying, it was during the Feast of Tabernacles, has, has really incredible uh, meaning. During the Feast of Tabernacles, they, um, there was these things called water processions. And they would bring, they would bring um, I think it said for seven days, the priest would bring this water from the, the pool of Shalom, which I guess is a, was it just a, a pool there by the temple. And they would bring it to the temple, and they would pour water at the base of the temple. And then um, it was symbolic of what was talked about in, in, uh, in, in Zechariah and in Ezekiel. Because um, they believed that Messiah would come and, the, and that the foundation stone of the temple would be split and the rivers of living water would gush out 
of the temple and bring life to the earth. That's what they believe. Why do they believe it? Because Ezekiel talks about that. That's what Ezekiel, about Ezekiel 47, about the temple, that's what it's referring to. It's referring to the, the water that they would come, they would pour it, and it would flow out into all the earth. The purpose of Jerusalem, of Israel, was to be a blessing into the entire earth. And so this was a symbolic act that they would do looking forward to that event when the kingdom would come and that the, the water, the river of living water, the water of life would go from Jerusalem to the rest of the world. And so when we look at, um, when we look at Zechariah 15, 14, it says, In that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem. This is what it's talking about. In that day is talking about, the re- that's when the Lord returns. It says, living water will flow out of Jerusalem. Ezekiel 47, the water in the temple, we know the story. The water started as a trickle, and it went up and up, and all the way it completely got to where it was higher, to where they had to swim, right? It was, just, it was a gradual, progressive thing. But what happened with that water? It said that the water was for the, it was for the healing of the nations. Revel, Revelation 22, we see the same thing. It's the, 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 the river of life where it went was for the healing of the nations. It says on both sides, uh, refer to the trees, and the, and the trees on both sides of the river, it was for healing of the nations. In, in Revelation 22, it indicates that the tree, it was a tree of life, right? And this is where the tree of life comes in. And we've talked about, I've talked about this many times, um, but the tree of, so most likely the tree of life was, was kind of like a vine, if you think about it. Because, I mean, it's on both sides of the river. Right? It's, not like a, it's not like a 50-foot trunk, you know, like it's, or wide trunk. It's, it's more like a vine. And then Jesus said, I am the vine, right? He said in John 15, I am the vine. So essentially, Jesus is the, represented in the tree of life. So when Adam had the opportunity it was essentially, it was the, the, the way he was going to be matured was from eating of the tree of life, that eternal life. That was the intent that God had. So now, because sin has been dealt with, we now have the new life. We can eat of the tree of life, right? It's life-based. And Jesus said, if you abide in me, right, and my words abide in you, that's eating, that's eating of his word, you will all happen. You will bear much fruit. And if you bear fruit, guess what? He'll prune us. Sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, the child trainer. Why? Why, was he, why does he prune us? To bear more fruit. To bear more fruit. Um, and so the purpose of the bearing more fruit, why? Is for the healing of the nations. Right, going back to the analogy or what I was talking about with Larry about you know, it's it's not just for him. Now, granted, he 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 gets blessed from it too, but it's it's for others. And so, as the life of Christ is in us more, we have God will use us to bring healing, healing to the nations. Um, and so, the indwelling life we have seed to fullness. Just because we have been born again, it says we've been born again of the incorruptible seed of the word of God. But guess what? It's a seed. Like, you know, if you have a seed, it's just, there's a, it's just a seed. A seed by itself is worthless unless it's planted. But it must be planted in good soil. And it must be watered. And it must have light. And it must have heat. But the seed's not doing anything. The seed, the seed just responds to those things, right? It's not like he's not like, okay, I'm going to become a tree now. No. He just has, he's in good soil. He's in, um, he has light and he has heat and he has water. It's a parable of, of, the, of the seed in Matthew 13. Um, it's interesting that if you read, I, just, I really just, maybe you've seen this before, but when I was studying for this, it really hit me, this the progression of Matthew 13 it, it, with the seed um, or different ways of looking at it. So the, the seed in the good soil, it produced fruit, 30, 60, 100. What does that mean? 
I mean, some are going to go for this harder than others. Some won't go for it at all. Some will be choked out by the cares of life. Others will go full on, 100%, 100-fold return. It's all based on, it's all based on our, heart, our hunger. I mean, it's, it really is. Like, if you're not hungry and you don't want this, okay. You know, you'll be saved after the fire. G- great. It's not about, like, doing. It's about your hunger and your, and your passion and your love for the Lord. Um, but he, then he links this to the end of the age. If you read it, it's right there. He talks about the end of the age, and it's the wheat and the tares. And in the story, um, when the wheat and the tares are, are there, they're small. You can't tell, essentially, you can't tell the difference between a wheat and a tare because it's not mature. So when we're first born again, guess what? You may not be able to tell the difference between, you know, a sinner and someone who was just born again. I mean, you can tell a little bit. But, again, it's, it's, that's, that, that's just, it's like a baby. Like, you don't expect a baby to, like, you know, drive a car. No. It's, it's, it's there's the maturing process. But the wheat and the tares, he's like, don't remove, don't go and remove the tares because you may remove the wheat too. But what happens as they mature, as they grow, is easy to tell. Do you know how you can tell? Tares straight up, wheat bows, right? Uh, And so the harvest is at the end of the age. So we think of harvest you know, in, in Christian lingo, ooh, the harvest, the harvest, and they're talking about salvation. Think how dumb this sounds. What farmer is like, hey, look at all these seeds I just planted. Look at, let's go harvest them. And like, okay, what are you going to do with the seeds? They're, they're worthless. That's not the harvest. The harvest is the, is the result of the seed growing. It's not like, so when we think of new converts as a harvest, that's, that's, that's wrong terminology. That's not a harvest. The harvest is the result of what happens with the fruit, with the seed. Okay, so it talks about the harvest. He says this in, in, in Matthew thirteen: the harvest is the harvest of sons. What does that mean? The harvest of sons. It's it's the adopt. It's Romans eight adoption. That lo- the creation longs for the revealing of the sons of God. That is the harvest. That is the harvest that he is talking about. It's the harvest at the end of the age. So we need to understand, again, to have proper context, the different ages that God works through. There's the age of the Gentiles, right? That is, the, that is from Adam to, um, to Abraham. That's characterized by unrestrained sin. Uh, the age of Israel, that's the, um, the Abrahamic covenant, it's the law, the prophets. Uh, the church age, which is what we're in now, that's inaugurated by the new covenant. Uh, it's to establish, this is the purpose of this age is to establish the kingdom of God in us. That's the purpose. That's, that is the sole purpose. It's preparing the vessel. It's preparing the sons. It's preparing the bride for the next age. Again, revelation is progressive. We see that from, from Adam to Abraham. Abraham and through Moses up until the church age, it was progressive. Each age has a specific, it's a, it's a greater unveiling of Christ, every single one of these. So we're in the church age. It's a, it's a great. It was great, a greater revelation of Christ than the previous age. Well, what's the next age? The next age is the kingdom age. This is when Christ returns. This is where he sets up, like literally returns physically. His feet will touch the ground. Setting up his kingdom from Jerusalem, he will rule over the nations for a thousand years with with the bride of Christ and sons. So the inheritance that could be ours, I'll say could because it's not automatic. Now, we're born again, we're in his family if we're born again, but the inheritance of being a son and ruling and reigning with Christ for a thousand years is, is not, um, it's not, it's, it's conditional, right? 
And then finally, the eternal ages. This is where the new heaven and the new earth coming down from heaven. This is, uh, now will there be more ages than that? We don't know. Scripture doesn't say. Um, the point in, in saying this is, there pro, is, is to get a, a good context of where we are. Um, going back to the vision, if we know that we are being groomed to be both the bride of Christ and to be groomed as sons to, to rule and reign with Christ physically on this earth very soon, then life has a very different meaning. There's, there's, a, there's a sense of purpose. Um, we're, but we're in the already but not yet. And this is where a lot of times people get confused. They're like, oh, I have the, I've, been, I've been raised with Christ. I've, um, you know, I have the new life of Christ. I've been raised with Christ. And they think that there's a term called preterism, which is a, basically a belief that everything's already happened. And it's like, well, no, it hasn't. It, I mean, some of it has. It's the already but not yet. Right? It's, we have the deposit. We have, uh, we, have the, um, we have the deposit of the Lord, but we don't have, it's not the fullness. Um, when Jesus came for the first time, it was, you know, it was what we, you know, the, to inaugurate the church age, he came as the bridegroom. It was the betrothal. We've talked about this before, but let's review it says, um, it says the kind of the, the steps of the betrothal, betrothal process. It says that the bridegroom traveled from his father's house to the house of the bride. Jesus came to earth. The marriage covenant was negotiated. Okay. It was sealed, get this, with the drinking of a cup of wine. When, when, when did Jesus have a cup of wine with his disciples. The Last Supper. What do you talk about? He says it's a new covenant. The new covenant is a marriage contract. It is, it is God's devotion to us as his bride. It says Jesus emptied himself. He left his father's house. Um, the Last Supper, this was the blood of his covenant. So when we do communion, it's essentially what it's talking about. It's the, it's the bridal covenant. Uh, the groom would then leave the bride and return to the father's house, and then they were they were legally married. And then um, the the bri the bridegroom would eventually come back and get his bride. And so that's what happened in the new cut. When we talk when he mentions the new covenant in in the book of John, the Last Supper, that's what he's referring to. It was a marriage contract that Jesus made with us. It's the new covenant. So he's going and he'll come back. So what's, what's the purpose of our life now? Is to be made ready for when he comes. The apostles were called friends of the bridegroom. We see that in, in the, uh, when he's talking to them about the, uh, the, the wine and wineskins. He's essentially saying that they're called to prepare his bride. Okay. So how do we how do we get, how do we get ready? We have the Holy Spirit in us. He's been he is our pledge. He is our down payment. We think of down payment as like I know we were talking about this in our home group last time. Um, as I think I have an image um, up there. I don't know if you see it, but when we think of down payment, oh, I'm going to put a down payment on a house, which. You know, if, say the average house is, you know, let's say $500,000. I don't know if that's the average, but let's just say it is. And a 20% a twenty down payment, that's a lot of money, right? Um, but think of like a down payment on a car. It may be smaller. But if we have the eternal life of Christ in us, trillions and trillions of dollars, a down payment, do we have an image up there? Yeah, so it's kind of hard to see, but... If you see the, just the difference between $10,000 and a trillion dollars, right? Just the order of magnitude. And so the point in sharing that and showing that is 
We may only have a down payment of the Holy Spirit within us, but it's massive. It's massive. It's like we we don't run or have, we don't understand the magnitude of that. Um, and so, the harvest at the end of the age. So we we know we were talking about the wheat and the tares. It's interesting. Um, you know, the harvest will be the sons of, it'll be the resurrection. When Jesus talks about birth pains, this is the birth that he's referring to. Um, you know, the birth pains is the birth of, of this, of, of the sons of God coming forth. And back to the transition or the periods, the different periods, between the, the age of Israel and the church age, there were three and a half years. It's a transitionary period. That's when Jesus' ministry was three and a half years. The, tr- the transition from the church age to the kingdom age is also three and a half years. It's the great tribulation. And, you know, Jesus talks about right before that happens, it's the birth pangs, the birth pangs, the birth pangs, the birth pangs, the birth pangs. So the birth is, is the sons of God coming forth. It's the resurrection, it's the resurrection of, the de- of, of the dead. So we're in the child training work of the Holy Spirit. When that time has come, there will be the resurrection. So all the end time stuff that has to happen, the only thing that matters is, is readiness. Is when the Lord, when, the, when, when his people are ready, that's when it's going to end. It doesn't matter like, you know, how many red heifers are shipped from Texas to to Jerusalem, it doesn't matter who the Antichrist is. It doesn't matter, you know, what's the mark of the beast. It doesn't matter. Those things are going to happen. But that's not driving the clock. What's driving it is the Lord saying, okay, yeah, there's enough readiness. Break the seal. Break the seal. And so the first fruits, and anytime there's a harvest, there's what is called the first fruits. So we know the, the fullness of the harvest is coming. There's a resurrection of the dead. It's when, it's when um, the revealing of the sons of God, anxious like creation is longing for the adoption of sons to see the sons of God come forth. And that is the harvest. That is the harvest at the end of the age that Jesus talked about, the wheat and the tares. That is the, the end event. But anytime there's a harvest, there's a first fruits. And we see the first fruits of this of this. Uh, the sons of God coming forth, we see it in, in Revelation 12. And that's the birth of the man-child. It, it, we see they're called up to God. That being called up, it's like, okay, they're ready. They're called up. That kicks off the last three and a half years. That's when the great tribulation start, when that event happens. Essentially, it's like, it's done, go for it. And we see in Revelation 14, they're referred to as the first fruits. They're the first fruits um, of, the, of, of the sons of God coming forth. An example of first fruits we see in the, in the feasts, we have, you know, uh, I think it's the time between what Passover and Pentecost is, is first fruits, whereas the final harvest is, is in the fall, right? Those were spring. They were first fruits. It's small. It's the, they're the first, but it's fewer. The larger one is coming. And so when the... Um, when the, the, the few first fruits are come into this, the rest will, will soon follow. But that three and a half years is what kind of kicks off the, um, it's, it's kind of what kicks off the, you know, everything. And so, again, hopefully this brought contact. I know it was a lot of, a lot of information, but, you know, essentially to summarize, We are called, we have, like, every single one of us are called to rule and reign with Christ, okay? When we, when we get, when we are born again, it's not so just that we can just go to heaven when we die. That's, I mean, that's, that will happen, but that's not God, that was not God's original intent. Original intent was to have a family who would rule and reign with him, right? Salvation is, is because of the fall, right? Salvation is because of the fall. So how do we, reigning by life, how do we, 
how do we now appropriate this? Like, how, does, how do we like turn this into action? Like, okay, I have the uncreated, indestructible life of God within my spirit. It's there. I have it. Now, now what? I still, you know, I'm getting older. You know, I feel that every day. Um, yeah, so our bodies are dying. Like we're, but how do I, how do I go from uh, just a normal person going through life aimlessly to someone who's reigning by life? How do we do that? You know, it says in, um, in Peter, it says, I'll just kind of paraphrase, but essentially um, that, he, that God's given us everything, not some things, everything, everything, everything for life and godliness. But it says what? Through the true knowledge of him. Okay, and then it, later on it says it's about being partakers of the divine nature. So the key to all of this is revelation knowledge of it. It's there. It's like the story in Brian's book where the guy had oil underneath his house and he didn't know it. The oil was always there. He just didn't know it. So if he didn't know it, it didn't do any good. But as soon as he knew it, it still may have not done any good if he didn't do anything with it. He's like, oh, yeah, there's oil under my house, but oh, well. No. There's oil under my house. Let me extract it out, right? So, one, we may not know it. Two, we may know it but not care about it as much. Or three, we may know it, care about it, and act on it. And that's where the true, um, the true fruit comes forth and true growth comes forth. There are no ceilings in, like God has for us. I know we think, oh, okay, you know, when I die, I'm going to get a new body. And all stuff. And I, man, I can't wait for that. But there's no, ex, there's no limit to the life of Christ that we can have now. There is zero limit. Back to the, the point of showing the analogy of the down payment of the Holy Spirit, there's no limits to that. There are very few people, human beings who have lived, have really experienced the fullness of, of, of what that means. But I am determined to be one of those, right? You know, my family's like, oh, you got a long way. I do. But guess what? I don't care, you know? I am, I am going to. Um, and I know I'm further along now than I was five years ago. So there you go. Um, but I, I'm going for it. Is it because I'm perfect? Absolutely. I mean, we saw it this morning when... when when I honked at my, you know, I called someone a fool with my horn. Like, no, I'm not. But my heart, my focus is this. And when life comes at me, like, I, I may, I'll get up. And, you know, it, again, it's, it's a focus. But understanding is, what's go, is, is really the key. Understanding this. Um, if you think about it, Think you could have a tree that is when in full growth could be, you know, 50, let's say 100 feet. But if it's in a small planter box, it'll stay that. It could be 100 years old and still that small. Why? Because it's confined to that space about this big. But if you remove it out of that, then what happens? It shoots up in growth. So growth, think of it as, as our knowledge expands of Christ, we get more understanding, more great, more, God begins to give us more insight. What happens? Growth. So it's, again, seed, we have the water, you know, it's the word, right? The, the, the cleansing of the Holy Spirit. We have the light, revelation knowledge, right? That's, that's what that is. Um, and then heat, you know, the trials, the testing. But as we expand, our, as our understanding grows, growth is, is what, growth, growth happens. And I think of, you know, probably the last nine years of my life, I've probably grown more than the rest of my life. But it came through revelation knowledge. It was all understanding and revelation. And so we see this in, in Romans 12, 
it says, I urge you, or therefore, I urge you, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, um, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, which is good and acceptable and perfect. So a few things that pop out here. Number one, Beal is talking about worship. Be a living and a holy sacrifice. What does that mean? Be a living and a holy sacrifice. It's denying yourself. It's taking up your cross. Uh, this is, I meant, I meant to mention this earlier. The part two of this will be next week. We're going to talk about um, the soul body and uh, in context with eternal rewards and, and the judgment seat of Christ. Um, but the, it's being a living sacrifice. Okay, being a living sacrifice Think of it like that's in context of the Old Testament. The priest, like, was the the oxen going to be all right? I'm going to be a living sacrifice. No, it was just there. It was there, and so essentially, a living sacrifice is like, you're, it means yieldedness to the. You're being you're yielding to the Lord. You're yielding to the child training work of the Holy Spirit. You're saying yes. I'm going to be trained. Yes, I'm going to yield to the to the work of the Holy Spirit, and so. What is, that's the first thing, is, is, is the yieldedness, right? And there's levels of that. There's the easy stuff, and then there's the harder stuff, at least for me, like honking at the, you know, honking at the, at the guy. Um, but the point is, we are being a living sacrifice. Then we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. So, what, so think of as our understanding and our knowledge of Christ increases, that brings transformation. So you're not going to get it every Sunday. But just, that's it. You're going to get it by meditating and dwelling and focusing on these things. And as we do that, we'll, we'll grow in understanding and we'll be changed. That's where transformation comes. And that word transformation is metamorpho. It's where we get metamorphosis. It means to change into another form, to be transformed, to, to transfigure. So in other words, as, as we have that seed and it begins to grow and we begin to expand the, the, uh, the planter, so to speak, it begins to grow and grow and grow. That same word is used in uh, the transfiguration when, when, when they, when Peter, James, and John, when Christ was transfigured before him, he, he completely took on a new form. It's the same word that's used here. So we don't have any clue what's inside of us because we can't see it. But if we were to be able to see it, we would be blown away. I mean, it says that when, when the... Uh, when the, when the resurrection happens, it says that those will be shine like, some will shine like the sun, some will shine like the moon, some will shine like the stars, all differing in glory, right? I think that's probably the 30, 60, 100, 100 maybe. I mean, last night I went outside and, and the sun, like it was, it was going down and I looked at it for just, I mean, not even a second, probably like a third of a second. I was like, whoa, so bright. But that was, that was like the sun was about to go down. I mean, think of it like the, sh the sun shining in its full strength. It's, that's, that seed is in us. The question, though, is it going to grow into, into something more? Um, and so next week, we're going to talk about the, you know, kind of continue, continuing this, you know, talk most specifically around the... Um, the sanctification of our soul, which our body goes into that too, because our body, that's our flesh, that's the cravings, that's, you know, the cravings of our flesh, right? Um, but our will is part of our soul. That's where, are we yielding to the Lord? Are we going to deny the, the sinful cravings of our body and submit to our spirit? Uh, there's, a, there's a scripture in Proverbs that says that he who controls his spirit is greater, is stronger than he who overtakes cities. So the training ground for ruling and reigning is now, is being those who, um, who will 
be able to rule by their spirit. It's, it's a spirit-filled, spirit-led life. It's being controlled by the Holy Spirit and, and being trained by the child trainer of the Holy Spirit so that we can, um, so that we can uh, be, have our inheritance as sons. Um, and so there's a few things in, in closing you know, I really want to encourage us to really, um, related to this, you know, God wants to get us into alignment with these things. Like, don't focus, I mean, we have to work, in, but that's part of your training. We have to deal with hard people, that's part of your training. We have to deal with hard things in life, it's part of your training. But we're called to be overcomers. We're called to be more than conquerors. Um, but in that, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, those two together, there's, there's two. I mean, the cares of this world, every single one of us deal with that, every single one of us, some more than others. We do. It's, it's part of it. It's not going away. It will not go away. Like the, the, the fantasy of, oh, when, I, when this happens and when this happens, well, guess that when that happens, there's about 50 things behind it that are coming. Like it, it's not going away. You know, now there are seasons when it gets easier. Then it gets harder again. Um, there are seasons that are just really, 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 really difficult. And those are, thankfully, there's a lot of those are few. For some, it's not. But God sees that and he understands. And it's not like, I'm not running a race against Larry. You know, thankfully, I would lose. Um, maybe not physically now, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> My race is against the talents that God has given me. If I have five talents, that's what God expects. He expects, he's, you know, someone who, to more, to, um, you know, to those who have been given a lot, it's expected a lot. So if you're going through the worst trial in your life and then it's like, there's nothing you can do, God, like, God doesn't expect, you know, he expects, you know, what he's given you. So your faithfulness is not in, Comparing yourself to others, it's it's basically what is God what is God given you and being faithful to that. I, I believe when we're when we're standing before the Lord, probably the majority of people close to the Lord are going to be people. Like, probably I mean, hey, it's Mother's Day. Probably moms who just selfishly, selfish, selflessly, just love their families, love their kids, gave everything. No one knew about them, you know. They, even in the cares of this world, they had the yes in their spirit and they just, you know, I love the Lord, I'm going to run after him. And they pray for their families and it's just, you know, it's the Lord's like, yes, they did it, right? That's going to be the majority. Um, but we have to not let the cares of life choke it out. It will, it'll choke it out. Um, now we'll still be saved, you know, but it'll choke, it'll, it'll choke it out. Don't, don't let it choke it out. Um, the next thing, we need to narrow our focus. There's a thousand and one things that we could focus on. Narrow your focus. There's a saying that says, jack of all trades, master of none. No. Focus. Focus on one thing. Like, focus on this. Yes, we have to do these other things, but focus. Make it, make it your focus. Um, Paul addressed this in Colossians. In Colossians, the church there, they were all over the place in, in their focus. Um, here's a few, like kind of summarizing what they were focused on. We kind of took, took you know, kind of went through the whole, the, whole, um, the whole book, the whole letter. We kind of like extracted what they were focused on. We could, we could find these things. Number one is they pursued the wisdom of men. Number two, they had decept deceptive traditions of men. Number three, they focused on elementary teachings. Um, they were seduced by the shadows of Judaism. They had leaders whose motivation was selfish ambition. And then, and then supernatural mysticism. And we see this, we see this in the church. I mean, in the supernatural mysticism, we think of like Bethel, right? Just some of the crazy, like, nonsense 
that comes out of, out of that church. It's a supernatural mysticism. And so Paul's basically saying, like, why? Why focus on these things? They're, le- they're, they're elementary. They're lower than. Why? You have Christ here, the calling of callings, the destiny of destinies, every single one of us, the, co- the most amazing thing before us, why in the world would you want to focus on the shadows or the things that are lesser? Don't waste your life on these stupid things. Like, folk, like, it's the, the most amazing destiny is before us. And we see, in John, like, John writing these letters to the, to the churches of Revelation, he's like, hey, here's, I'm going to help you narrow your focus. See these areas, these seven churches? They represent the whole landscape of the church. Like, if you could take from any generation from now until, or from when Christ, uh, the resurrection until now, when the church was birth until now, this, these seven churches essentially represent the entire landscape of the church. Here's the things that you need to focus. I'm going to help you, all right? You may not understand everything, but if you can just focus on these things, you're, you're going to get it, right? And so we'll talk about that next week. Um, but one, one kind of story in closing, and where this is dangerous, like, it's, so, again, like, if we pursue these lesser things, we may be fine. It may not matter. We'll, 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 we won't be as mature. We'll miss out on, on fruit. But there's also a danger. I mean, the book of Hebrews kind of tells us that. The you know, book of Hebrews is basically written to Jewish believers in Messiah who were on the verge of apostasy. Some of them did apostatize, I'm sure. They were on the verge of apostasy. Right, because they didn't fully go on fully with Christ. They were still kind of like teetering between the two. But it got hard. It got hard, and they were close to apostatizing. Some of them did. Some of them obviously you know, didn't. And so the author of Hebrews, which I believe is Paul, is pleading with them, like, don't apostatize. So you can see, like, Apostasy can creep in by these lesser things if it, if it grows and grows and grows, and it could essentially um, you know, choke out the word, our, our testimony. And I was dri- when we were driving in, or I was driving in on the way in, I was rem- reminded of the story. I can't remember all the details, but I think it was someone Brian knew who knew, like, he was into, uh, you know, he was into a lot of the, the shadows of Judaism up to, to the point where he began, He eventually denied Christ. He denied the Messiah because he got so sucked away. And at the, at the end of this age, we're going to see the fullness of every, all of these things in the, in the uh, supernatural. We're going to see, a lot, but a lot of it's going to be false, right? We're going to see the, the resurrection or the revitalization of the temple in Jerusalem Right? We're going to see a lot of these things, and a lot of people are going to be swept away by this, by this delusion. Um, I want to close with a story about Nicodemus. So Nicodemus in John 3, we saw he came to Christ, but he didn't necessarily, we, we, had, we didn't know by reading John 3, did he, did he accept that? We, we don't, we, it doesn't say. But um, church history, I found out this a, a few months ago, uh, whatever happened to Nicodemus. And apparently, he, um, he got born again. And he, so you think of, like, the cost, that what that cost him. Especially in light of the book of Hebrews that we just talked about, what that cost him. Right? He's, he's there, like, most likely... That letter was to him because he was in that group and like, you know, he's encouraged, you know, let's just say Paul was encouraging them like, don't, don't go back. Don't go back. Don't apostatize. Don't go back. Don't go back. And it's probably, he's probably a recipient of that letter. And so Nicodemus, he was, he was one of the top, top persons of all of this. 
Well, guess what? His, I mean, think about it. His whole, all his life, his family, his income, everything he had, he, he left it. He left it all, and he followed wholeheartedly after the Lord. And guess what? He ended incredibly poor and ostracized and, um, you know, the scum of the earth, so to speak, in his society. He went from one of the top people in his country to a nothing that nobody wanted anything to do with. But he was so in love with the Lord, you know. And um, there's a story, well, part of that story is I guess his daughter was so hungry um, you know, because of poverty and, of, I mean, his, his decision affected other people, right? It affected his family. Um, and she was, like, be, like, trying to get food, like, searching for it. And some rabbi came by and was like, hey, what, what's going on? Let me, let me help you. And she was like, yeah, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. She's like, here, he's like, I'll help you, I'll help you. And he's like, she's like, yeah, I'm Nicodemus's um, daughter. It's like, whatever happened to Nicodemus? Well, he followed the Messiah and lost everything. And the rabbi said, I'm not helping you, and left her there to, to start, I mean, hungry without helping her. So you see the cost that they had to pay. Um, but when you encounter the life of Christ, you know, it's worth it. It's worth it. So, all right. Well, why don't we stand and pray? And Lord, I just I come to you. We, Lord, we pray. I know there's a lot of information, God. We, we pray this, there would be clarity, God. There would be a sense of focus. There would be a renewed focus. There would be a hunger for you. There would be a spirit of re- wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, God. We just pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation, that all of us would have that spirit of wisdom, that spirit of revelation in the knowledge of you, Jesus. God, we pray that there would be a hunger. God, we pray that you know, those who are going through the trials of their life, God, we pray for grace, grace, grace. Lord, if there's any sense of, oh, I can't do this, oh, oh, you know, Lord, I pray that there would be none of that, that there would just be, God, this is not a, just as we had nothing to do, all we had to do was say yes, Lord, and you did the work. That's pretty much what happens with sanctification. We have to say yes, and we have to take up our cross, and you do the rest. So, Lord, I I pray for your peace to be upon us. I pray for your joy, that you would be peace in us, that you would be joy, that you would be love, that you would increase, that you would increase just as the river goes from from trickle to fullness. We pray that 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 river of life that is in us, the river of the Holy Spirit, would flow into, it would grow into a mighty rushing river, just as Jesus said, he who believes in me, he who, so it was a future thing that Israel thought, but he says, no, it's now. He who believes in me, these rivers of living water will flow out of that person. And the purpose of that flow is to bring healing to the nations. So the way we pray as we go, that we would be healing to the nations. God, we pray that, that, Lord, we are the living epistles read of our, all men. We are to be healing, we are to heal the nations now through the life of Christ in us. We pray, God, it would grow and be maximized into fullness, into fullness, that we would be that light into the darkness, that we would be light into these dark places, that we would be light into these dark places in Jesus' name. Ellie, Ellie, Ellie.